Back in 2012, I published a book called The Black Church, where women pray, P-R-A-Y, and men pray, P-R-E-Y. That book came on the heels of an article that I wrote in 2010, I think it was, that went viral. I mean, it had me on interviewed by CNN. It was on television, uh, on the radio with Al Joyner and, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Al Sharpton, Tom Joyner, and just a lot of big name uh, radio shows as well as small local stations. The reason why people were so up in arms was because that article flatly accused a large segment of the Christian community that operates in the African-American world of intentionally doing all they can to keep black women single. My premise is that they did that for a reason. And the reason is because if you have black women who are making most of the money in the black community in the church, funding the church and filling up them pews, they were thereby filling up the pastor's pockets. And without those women being under his control versus that of a husband, they would lose control of those women's money. The husbands would run interference and keep them from giving all that money to the church because they need it for the house. These men know that. So the best way to do that is to keep the black women single. So that was my premise. You would have thought I said, kill God. But in the interim, what has happened is a lot of people have come forth, a lot of women have come forth and they've discussed how they broke the shackles of religion and how they have freed their minds. Now, with Christianity being the top religion in the world, it's reportedly two to three billion people follow it. Um, that's no easy feat, especially if you've been raised up in the church and everybody in your family still follows that belief system. What do you do? If you abandon it and that's all that you've known for your entire life, you followed all those scriptures, you went to church every Sunday, possibly even more than that. What do you fill that blank with, that hole within your life? What do you, how do you think? How do you change your thinking? How do you change your behavior? What guides you? Who is going to be the person or the entity that you thank when something goes really well in your life? Or who do you blame when something goes really poorly? I'm going to be talking about all that. I'm going to be exploring what, explain to uh, this young lady who wrote in asking those questions, what faith is and how to develop more faith and belief in herself. I don't have, you know, religion and me. We just don't get along at all. So my, my views are going to be coming from that perspective. I don't see where it's doing women any good at all. I'll explain those thoughts, though, and I'll uh, answer her question about what she should do now that she's put down religion and God. What should she pick up in its place? I got some ideas for you. This is Deb Cooper from SurvivingDating.com and here on the Debsterism channel on YouTube. Hang with me. I'll be right back. of days ago, I got an email in from a channel visitor asking about what to do with herself now that she's moved beyond religion. And she, well, I'll just read you, the, I'll just read it to you. She says, hey, Deb, I was wondering if you've ever done a series, and if so, please direct me to the videos on life after faith slash God. I know where you stand, but being someone who believed in man-made God almost all my life, I now just feel tricked. I have been pondering on what happens outside of becoming an atheist when you no longer believe the way that you were taught. Example, who do you now give thanks to when something good or bad happens to you? Or who do you put your trust in when others fail you? That was the whole premise behind having faith. It's like someone buying you the present you most desired, but not leaving their name on the card. You know what I mean? 
I think so many women on your channel may have been there at one point after the church failed them. So I was just wondering what and who do they turn to now? What can you still believe or can you, I'm sorry, Kirsten, can you still believe in God or a higher power? Now, as I said in my intro, Christianity is the number one religion in the world and it's some version of it is the top religion practiced in the black community. A study done has proven repeatedly, actually, that African-American women are the number one most religious demographic in the country. So when you look at all the churches and what do you see are row after row after row after row of black women. So those are the women who are funding these building funds and the food, the lunches and the dinners, doing all the cooking, doing all the cleaning and the ones that are lining the pastor's pockets with their ties and donations, those black women. Okay, so when you have a black woman who has been raised in that environment, she has what I call groupthink. She follows what has been told to her by the pastor, what kind of things are being told to her as a child in Sunday school, the things that her parents have reiterated that they are regurgitating from those same sources. And it becomes a thing where your faith is based on the trust that what these people are telling you is factual, that what they're telling you is real, and you hope that it is. So that's what I want to kind of talk about is, to me, the premise, the principles of religion are basically three things. It's like a 310 fork. They're based, religion is based on hope. It's based on faith. And there's two kinds of that. I'll go over that in a minute. And then it's based on trust. Now, when you talk about uh, hope, which, you know, I, I try to get you guys not to not to be hoping. I want you to go with what you see and what is reality. OK, hoping is putting stock in something that there's nothing. There's no evidence that that's going to ha be what happens. But you're banking on it anyway. You're betting real life feelings, your real life emotions, your real life money on something that you you just hoping it out going to happen out of the clear blue sky you don't have any foundation to have this hope okay and when you have religion what they do is feed you stuff that has you hoping for a specific desired outcome you hope that by following these scriptures and listening to the pastor and doing all the things your parents told you to do and not doing the things they told you not to do, that you're going to have this desired outcome. You're going to get to heaven. You're going to be one of the ruling 144,000 people that they talk about in the Jehovah Witness. You're going to do anything that takes you to some land of you know, harps and angels and milk and honey. That's what you hope. So you also hope that people that you interact with who say that they are your same religion, that they believe what you believe and that they will act the way that you act, that they also can be trusted. That's what you hope. Against all odds of reality, because you don't know these people, but they just say that they're, you know, they're a believer and instantly your guard goes down and you start trusting them. You're hoping that that's what you can do. Hmm. Okay, then we move on to faith. So right now, I'm to, in case you lost track, because I am using a lot of words, I'm talking about the three principles of religion based on my view, based on hope, based on faith, and based on blind, unearned trust. You just blindly trust somebody based on something that they said. Okay? So there's two kinds of faith. There's the kind that I call evidentiary, which has a, you have faith in something based on, um, I don't know, like a history of observation, history of personal experience, something like that. And then there's blind faith where there's no evidence. There's no proof. You believe something to be real. You believe something to be true, even though you have. It's just based on air. It's based on your feelings or something. I don't know what it's based on, really. But you don't have any grounds to have that faith in that thing, that person. There's no reality there. There's no evidence or proof that this person deserves your faith and belief in them. Okay. Faith basically is because when people have this, what they call a strong faith, 
and you hit them with something that contradicts their belief system, they get this attitude like, well, you know, my mind is made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. That's what faith is. Even though you're going to maintain this faith, even though it may fly in the face of absolute evidence that contradicts your belief system. And a lot of people dig in their heels and say, well, you know, that's faith. That's what that's what it is. You know, you're going to be challenged. And stuff, but if you really believed and, you know, you have to have faith. OK, that's a closing your mind. Basically, when you have faith like that, that kind of blind faith in something, you base that all on wishful thinking. That's what you're doing. Then there's the evidentiary kind of faith. Like I said, like say you noticed, I don't know, uh, that everybody who graduates from UC Berkeley, Stanford, Harvard, you know, Columbia, Yale, Princeton, these kind of stuff, get the high paying jobs. They become CEOs. They have big companies that are worth millions, this kind of thing. And then you see the people who go to, I don't know, some little local, you ain't never heard of it, college, don't have those opportunities. So you notice that trend, right? Okay, this is a, a this faith that you have that if you graduate from that school, you're going to have better opportunities than somebody who didn't is based on on history. So that kind of faith is what I call evidentiary faith. It's based on something tangible and real. You can call names. You can look at paychecks. You can look at tax returns. You can look at, you know, the, the financial statements of the companies these people own. There's evidence of it. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so that's faith. So we covered hope. We covered faith. Now let's talk about trust. When you have unearned trust, that means that you just believe what somebody tells you without vetting them. You believe what you hear some dude tells you, well, yeah, you know, uh, I'm looking for a woman just like you. And you believe it just because he said it, even though he's cheating, even though he's married to somebody else. You want to hang on to those words that he said and give him trust that, you know, it's going to be true sometime in the future, at possibly maybe. Versus what the reality is staring you right in your face. He's a liar and he's a cheat. So why are you trusting him with anything? So to me, when you earn trust, you, I mean, someone earns your trust is because you have properly vetted them and they have, you know, you then give your, your trust. And it's based on the fact that you've taken the time to verify these per this person's statements and the things that they say that they are, the th person that they present themselves to be, you have taken time to make sure that that is true. Is it foolproof? Absolutely not. Because as we've noticed in our series here, you're going to run into some narcissists who are so good at running game and playing to pretending to be something else. You know, you might be a year, two, three into the relationship before they pull off that sheep's clothing. So I'm not saying this is foolproof, but I'm saying it's much better to at least do something than it is to just blindly believe everyone who comes in your face telling you a tale and just running with it because, you know, you want to believe that because they're a Christian that they must be telling the truth because why would a Christian lie, right? So this young lady's looking at, um, you know, what she should do and who she should look, who she should thank when something goes right in her life, you know, you're going to thank yourself. You know, who's going to be responsible for the stuff that goes good and bad in your life? You. This is called being accountable. It's called being the master of your own destiny. It's called being the admiral of your own ship. You've always been that. You've always been in charge of that. But for some reason, religion teaches women, especially that they are powerless, that you have to be on your knees asking some invisible person, thing, entity for help when you could get up and you could stand up and you could help yourself. You don't need some invisible sky daddy to help you do nothing. All of that is a figment of your imagination. You know the time you should, the time you spend on your knees, you should be standing up doing something to help yourself. You need more money, get online and find a second job. Or take a class and get a get a raise, you know, get a promotion because you've taken these educational courses. You've gotten a second degree. You've done something to help yourself. That comes from you. That does not come from being on your knees asking nobody for nothing. OK, there's a big difference. Here. This is what we call responsibility for self and being accountable for self. That is something that is trained out of people when they spend too much time 
hearing re of religious stuff because they teach you that you're powerless, that you have to get, you know, your life is turned over to some other thing that you can't even see. You can't deal with it. You can't feel it. You can't talk to it. Nothing. Any talking that you're doing, you're talking to yourself. Okay, you're talking to yourself. Why can't you give yourself those messages and not have to be associated with any religion? Why can't you tell yourself, girl, you can do this? You can make this shit happen. You can achieve this dream. You can be all of that and do all of that. All you have to do is focus. What you going to do? What you going to do? Why can't you tell yourself that? You know, I think that, you know, when I, was, when I remember when I was studying, uh, uh, what do you call it, researching for the book, I ran into some psalms and things that have to do with teaching women that they aren't really anything. You know, I mean, it's like it makes you feel bad. I mean, you, you, a lot of times people don't even think about the messages that they're listening to and how they're absorbing that into their spirit. You may think that it's being helpful and it's teaching you not to be haughty and arrogant and all this kind of stuff, but what it's really teaching you is that you ain't shit. That's what that, those three things teach you. Like Psalms 515, behold, I'm sorry, 51, 5, I've got dyslexia. Behold, I was brought forth in inequity and in my sin. My mother conceived me. Okay, so, I mean, before you even get, I mean, before you even become, like, born, you already a sinner. So you already start behind the eight ball. Ephesians 2, 3. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, as though one main sin entered the world and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, so, you know, me, I'm listening to all this kind of stuff. I'm like, okay, well, there's nothing I can do here because you already got me failing and, and a, a sinner and a piece of shit before I even get out the womb. So, I mean, what, 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 what? what? I don't even understand. I don't understand why anybody would want to participate in anything that berates and demeans them like that. You know, I, I just don't get it. I don't understand it. So what can you do? You know, I have um, some quotes here that I want to share with you before I go into my next section. When one door of happiness closes, another opens, but we often look so long at the closed door that we don't see the one which is open for us. That's attributed to Helen Keller. She was blind and even she could see that. Those who will not govern themselves are condemned to be fine masters to govern over them. Stephen Pressfield. This is unfortunately the mentality of a lot of African Americans. You know, he's talking about we need a leader. Lead your damn self. Okay, why, why can't you direct your own path in life? Why do you need somebody to tell you what to do, how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, and if it's good enough? Why do you need that? You better get yourself together, ladies. And the third one from Napoleon Hill, I don't know how many of you read him. He's the author of the book Think and Grow Rich. I mean, that book has been translated into 900 different languages, and it's like one of the top-selling books in the world. If you haven't read it, I highly, highly suggest that you do. And Napoleon says discipline comes through self-control. This means that you must control all negative qualities. Before you can control conditions, you must first control yourself. Self-mastery is the hardest job you will ever tackle. If you do not conquer self, you will be conquered by self. And I love that quote. Because it just shows, you know, either you stand up and you you make yourself be the person you want yourself to be or somebody else is going to come along and have you being the person they want you to be. Which one do you want? That second one, it never ends well, especially for women. It never ends well at all. So when you talk about this faith, um, you know, little kids have faith. They have faith. Like your parents tell you, oh, Santa Claus is coming. Okay, well, you're a little kid. I mean, you have faith in your parents. You trust them, right? And so you believe what they say. Even your parents know that they lied to you like a dog. It's, it's an interesting kind of complex thing there. But you as a child have faith that what your parents are saying is true. 
Well, if you have that kind of childlike mentality as you and you carry that through your life, you're going to go into church and you're going to hear what them, them jack leg preachers got to say. And you're going to have the same mentality. Well, since they said it, it must be true. You're going to see stuff on the Internet. Well, since it's on the Internet, it must be true. And you're going to be talking to some jack leg fool on some social media site or on a personal ad site. Well, since he said it, it must be true. This is a problem that I have is like when you close your mind to ask questions, to be a person who wants to know what's behind the door, to understand what makes things tick, to vet things, to make sure it's really the way that it says it. If you close your mind to all that and you just go on what people tell you without questioning it at all, you're gullible and you end up being a victim. And the only way that you can be successfully involved in a religious environment is if you're that kind of person. You don't ask no questions. You don't doubt anything. You listen to what you're told and you do what you're told. That's group think, ladies, and you got to stop doing that. Now, I understand it takes people time. I'm not saying to do drop it tomorrow. I'm saying start thinking for yourself. You know, you got to start making choices that are in your own best interest, aside from what somebody, some pastor, some other man, your husband even, is telling you to do. You do what you need to do to make yourself feel good. And hard part of this comes with, um, you know, the fear of, of, of trying to figure out, like, what do you need, why you need somebody else to tell you what to do or who, who do you think? I mean, why can't you just thank yourself? I know that if I achieve something, it's because my ass has worked for it. That's why I hate that phrase, black girl magic. It makes it sound like everybody's bewitched and just dink a dink a dink on their nose. And then stuff happens and they get granted things. That's not how it works. As a black woman, you got to be twice as good and work twice as hard to get the same stuff that just falls into white girls' laps. We all know this. So to sit there and think that you have to depend on some entity outside of yourself to make yourself achieve and dream and accomplish things, you're never going to get where you need to be like that. You better roll your sleeves up and get gully with yourself. You got to have confidence. That's the thing I think that's missing in a lot of of women who follow religion. You there's no belief in yourself as being a person of power. All the power belongs outside of yourself. You're looking for something outside of yourself to direct your actions, to tell you how to think, to tell you how to behave, to tell you what's right, to tell you what's wrong, to tell you what you can and cannot do, how you can and cannot dress. All kinds of things about your how you live your life are dictated by these religions and your brain is turned off. You're just absorbing rules and regulations and limits and boundaries based on what these people tell you is right and proper you you believe it without ever questioning it so the get way around this young lady to respond to your question anyway is you have to start working on building up your own confidence and belief in yourself it's going to be hard like napoleon said is one of the top the things that people struggle with the most is self-mastery and it requires that you have a willingness to take risks and to fail. Because you know what? You know the only people who never make a mistake and who never fail is people who don't do shit. They are never trying to be innovative, creative, or do something different outside the box. They just listen to what everybody else does and follow along and do what they do. Because it's safe. It's easy. There's no challenge. There's no risk. If you're going to be a mover and a shaker in this world, or you're going to go out and make marks on the planet and marks in history, you have to be willing to sit all that safety aside and step out. Okay? You have to be able to do that. And you have to have the belief in yourself that you can. So when, you have, when you're a confident woman, you trust your judgment. You trust your abilities. You trust the way that you think. You value yourself. You feel worthy. And you know that even if you have imperfections and things about yourself that you don't necessarily think are the best because we all have them, you don't worry about that. You focus on your strengths. And you certainly don't worry about what other people think because are they paying you? Do they Are they benefiting your life in any way? Why do you care what they think? You know, you have to see yourself as being able to achieve 
the goals that you set for yourself, at the dreams that you have, you have to be able to see yourself as being capable of making them come true all by yourself. You sit down and you think of how you're going to make that happen. Do I need to take a class? Do I need more money to pay for the classes? What do you need? What do you have to do? Map it out and then get busy doing it. Get off your knees. You don't have to ask nobody for nothing. Every single woman listening to this video is fully capable of making changes in her life all by herself. You don't need nobody's permission. You don't need nobody's buy-in. And you don't need the support of some invisible sky person that you have to tithe 10% of your income to and you don't know where it's going or what's happening to it. You don't have to do that. I think um, the number one thing I want to do is also I want to talk about the tenets of religion because I remember seeing a a video with Steve Harvey talking about, he kept using the word moral compass, saying if somebody's agnostic or atheist, what's their moral compass? He kept saying he was just adamant that you couldn't possibly be a decent person unless you was going by some religion. And I'm saying that, you know, what's a good person is not is not limited to a religion, not one religion, not 20 religions. You Everybody knows how to treat somebody else. Everybody knows how to talk to other people. We all know that. Now, some people choose not to do it. But though the, the fact that you are a decent person or, or not is not mandated by a religion. It's mandated by who you want to be as a person and how you want to roll in the world. That's what that's all about. So when you talk about the tenets of Christianity, there's, you know, like the, the belief systems, what, what everybody teaches, the, count, the foundational core, whether you uh, Lutheran or Methodist or AME or Catholic or, you know, all these Christian based kinds of religions. They all have certain belief systems. Number one is that you love God. Two, that you love your neighbor as you do yourself. That you forgive other people who have wronged you that you love your enemies, that you ask for forgiveness of your sins. You believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that he was given authority to forgive others. That repentance of sins is essential. Notice all the focus on mistake and sin. That you not be a hypocrite, that you do not judge other people, and that it's not the rich and the powerful who are going to make it into this mystical, magical heaven, but the weak people and the poor people. Those are the ones who are supposed to be inheriting this kingdom that's created by God and vice president by Jesus Christ. So, you know, but what are those things? What do these things really mean? These just mean that you treat other people with kindness. That if someone makes a mistake and transgression against you, unless they did it on purpose, now then that's a whole new story. But, you know, people are going to make mistakes. They're going to say stupid stuff and they're going to be sorry for it after. OK, if they offer you a sincere apology, don't be grudgeful. Hold it. You know, excuse it. Let's move on here. Holding on to that stuff is toxic to you as well as to them. Um, and as far as you know, asking for forgiveness of your sins, uh, why? Because you know what a sin is. If you don't want to live that way, like lying, not honoring your mother, cheating, adultery and all that stuff, we all know what not to do. We don't need somebody telling us that. And you definitely, if you made a decision to do it, you have hella nerve to go up there trying to ask for forgiveness for the shit you did intentionally. Don't you even try that. That's when the hypocrite part comes in. You think you can do what you want to do and then just go and, and pray it away? That's not how it works. So if you model yourself as a human being that's of, that walks through the planet with dignity and respect for self and dignity and respect for others, then you won't ever have any of these problems. You won't need to ask for forgiveness and you won't need to pray for sins because you're not acting stupid. You're conducting yourself like you have some sense. So in closing here, young lady, you don't blame anybody. You don't ask nobody for nothing. That all, everything that you need, all the inspiration you need, all the power you need, all the energy you need, the direction, the creativity, everything is in you already. All you have to do is trust yourself. You just have to stop letting other people make you doubt yourself or, or feel bad about yourself or think that you need some kind of validation from outside of yourself. You do not. 
When you look in the mirror, that person staring back, that's the only person you need to validate you. That's the only person whose forgiveness you need to ask for. That's the only person who you need to thank for what happens good to you. The only person that you need to say, girl, what was you doing? If you mess up something, you know, you it's all about you. You're the one who is the master of your world. You are the admiral of your ship. Just you. Okay. Every decision that you make is like a fork in the road. It's going to take you in one direction or another. You're going to veer off left, but you could come on back. You know, that happens. That's just the way that it is. In closing, I want you to believe in yourself. This is something that I wrote some time ago. It's still on my computer, so I'm going to share it with you today. It says, women have been socialized to believe that they are weak indecisive that they need someone to take care of them like a child and therefore must be told what to do and how to do it religion and marriage are both a part of this brainwashing as carriers of life we each have an amazing connection to each other and to the universe that we don't even understand you are very powerful you have the power to manifest every success every accomplishment and every goal if you just believe that you can no one is as important in your life as you are. Believe that you can make it happen. Believe that you can do it. Believe that you are good enough. Believe in yourself. Or not. Because what you believe is possible for you is what will always happen. And in the end, either way it goes, you will always prove yourself right. All right? So I want you to prove me right and let me know how you do. Okay? I'm here if you have more questions. Type them down below in the comment section. Okay, I'm going to sign it out.